Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. Joining us today is George H. Smith. He was formerly Senior Research Fellow for the Institute for Humane Studies, a lecturer on American history for Cato Summer Seminars, and Executive Editor of Knowledge Products. His fourth book, The System of Liberty, was recently published by Cambridge University Press. He's also a contributor to Libertarianism.org in many ways, including his popular weekly column. And he's the co-editor with Marilyn Moore of the Libertarianism.org book, Individualism, a Reader. But today we're here to talk about your friend Roy Childs. You wrote an introduction where you talked about Roy's ideas and your relationship with him for an ebook Libertarianism.org put out quite a while ago. There was a collection of his works called Anarchism and Justice. So how did you first – Meet Roy, or when did you meet him? Okay, some of this, just to let uh, listeners know, some of this information will probably duplicate material in that introduction, which was published and posted in five parts on, on part of my libertarianism.org series. But in any case, I met Roy in person uh, in early 1971. He had been in New York. Uh, he had he was well known at the time. He had worked with Jarrett Wolstein on um, the Rational Individualist, as it was called. They later changed the name to The Individualist. It was a very early libertarian magazine. But I thought I used to joke with Roy about taking the word rational out. Like, we'll go for every, anybody, whether they're rational or not. <laughs> and uh, anyway, by that time, he had written his very famous and influential article, uh, Anarchist on, uh, on Open Letter to Ayn Rand. But he and I had corresponded briefly because um, uh, the Rational Individualist was starting uh, local chapters at colleges. I formed one of the first at the University of Arizona. Uh, SRI, it was called, later changed to SIL, Society for Individual Liberty. And we'd had some correspondence. They had this sort of nifty little organizational kit for college campuses. It was cheaply done, but they had no money. And so I had some correspondence with him. He knew of some things that I had written. I knew of him primarily through his uh, article in Open Letter to Ayn Rand. And when he came out to California, he came out to attend one of Nathaniel Brandon's therapy groups. It was sort of the thing to do among libertarian types. We all went to one or another Brandon's therapy groups during the time. When was this? Uh, I met him in early 71. Uh, he called me on the phone. I don't know exactly how he got my phone number, but he wanted to meet me. And I honestly can't remember our very first meeting, but we really got along very well. It was just one of those instant bondings where you just are talking. You know, you meet at 7 and you're talking until 7 in the morning. And uh, I found him a fascinating character. Uh, he liked me, I think, because I was open to new ideas and interested in learning whatever I could from people who knew more than I did. And Roy certainly in many areas knew more than I did. And uh, what finally kind of cemented it, I was living in Inglewood near LAX, and uh, I had to move. And Roy said, why don't you move in this apartment building where I'm living? It was on Selma Ave Avenue in Hollywood, and then we can chat every day. So they were basically efficiency apartments, and uh, I moved into the same building. So we lived in the same building uh, for uh, it was a little over a year until he moved back to New York. And uh, we saw each other literally every day. We did everything together. We were both broke writers. It was sort of the classic story of the salad years. Uh, n neither of us had any money. I was working on my first book, Atheism and the Case Against God. He was, among other things, writing, uh, not only running books for libertarians, which was an early version of Libertarian Review, doing reviews, but he was also working on that wonderful series he were, uh, wrote called Anarchism and Justice. So we'd get together every day, sometimes for hours, and talk over what he was working on, what I was working on. He gave me advice about things in my book. I gave him some feedback about what he was doing. And it was, I have to say, in terms of just the sheer intellectual excitement, it was one of the most exciting years of my life. We were both young. I, Roy only was a month older than I was. We were the same age. Uh, we came from similar but somewhat different backgrounds. He had strong personal connections with Murray Rothbard who at that time I had never met. And it was largely through Roy that I had first learned of the ideas of Murray Rothbard. I had read a little bit by him before that. But as with many people, uh, you have to understand the movement at that time, which we can get into later if you want. It was very young and uh, very exciting because it just seemed like the sky was the limit. And uh, But he got me very interested in Murray's ideas. I had converted to, his, to the Rothbardian version of anarchism after reading... Um, his open letter to Ayn Rand, which was published when I think it was in 69. So he didn't have to convert me to that, but 
uh, he, he convinced me of a lot of. Can things. Can you talk a little bit about about his personality in that sense? Because that was <laughs> that that's the sense I got when I, especially when I came to Cato first and uh, started meeting people who knew Roy. Yeah, did and, you ever meet him personally? I did not, and uh, and I, people who knew Roy and and everyone was very affected by him in many ways, so yeah. intellectually and personally. Yeah, he he was one of the great personalities of the modern movement. The only person who would even come close to Roy in personal charisma that I can think of was Nathaniel Brandon, who was also very charismatic. But Roy was more engaging, more outgoing. Uh, you just hard not to like him when you first met him. Uh, he was uh, I used to call him the uh, after Star Wars. Uh, came out, I call him the Yoda of the movement. He was sort of the guy that kids would cluster around at conferences and ask sort of what I like to call guru questions, kind of open-ended questions like like a master, you know, tell impart some of your wisdom. He liked that role and he was very good at it. Uh, he had a he was very large physically. That's a problem that eventually caused his severe health problems. When I first met him, actually he was quite trim. Uh, he had uh, separated from his wife. He wasn't in good shape psychologically, so he wasn't eating that much. And he used to swim every day in the pool in that apartment building we lived in. Uh, later, of course, he started to gain his weight back. But his personality was just, I, I hate to use cliches, but it was larger than life. He really was just a very interesting guy to be around. I, never got, I honestly can say I never got bored being around Roy. It also seemed like there was no intellectual subject that was foreign to him. No, he would talk about anything. And he was just, he, it wasn't just an exterior of a charismatic personality. He really had a first rate mind. One of the things, we were very blunt with one another. I was probably one of the few people who wasn't actually intimidated by Roy. And I would tell him exactly what I thought. I would jump all over him if I thought he did or did not do something. One example of that would be when he arranged, he was, you have to understand at this time, the whole anarchism, minarchism controversy, minarchism being a term coined by Sam Konkin for advocates of limited government. Uh, we were both spending a lot of time with both Nathaniel and Barbara Brandon. We both wrote book reviews for academic associates, which was run by Barbara and Bob Barol. Bob Barol being the rational dancer in uh, Tuchili's book, it usually begins with Ayn Rand. Uh, nice people. They were living together at the time. I spent a lot of time in her apartment, which ironically I later moved into myself long after she had left uh, that apartment building. And uh, he was he was the go-to guy to argue about the anarchist controversy. It was a much bigger controversy then than it really is now. I think it's settled down a lot, although I think the issues are still interesting and important. But everyone in the L.A. area, and L.A. at Southern California was one of the really active hubs uh, there were others in San Francisco and New York, but I think Southern California, just everybody seemed to be in Southern California, uh, people who would later disperse throughout the United States. But you could go to a meeting of some kind or another once or twice a week easily. Uh, so Roy and I did a lot of supper clubs. We engaged in debates with other people. But um, actually, uh, Brandon, Nathaniel Brandon, once suggested a debate, an informal debate on the anarchism, minarchism controversy to be held at Barbara's apartment on Franklin Avenue, not far from the Chinese theaters. Uh, and I was going along as Roy second. And Barbara and Nathan, Nathan would be the primary debater on the limited government side, and uh, Barbara would be the backup. So we met at Barbara's apartment, had a, basically a three-hour discussion. And then uh, Brandon said, why don't we continue this? And so we went back uh, maybe a week later for another three-hour discussion. Now, I brought that, that up would have because... Been a, that would have been a good thing to have on tape. Yeah, I always regret it, but I have a good memory of it, and I don't know if you want me to tell the story, but the reason I brought that up was I thought Roy dropped the ball in the first discussion. Um, well, before we go into that, actually, though, because I would like to go back uh, to, to try to parse out oh, some sure. of his ideas on the, the open letter to Ayn Rand. Yeah, so, I mean, that seems to be this... I mean, it's an important text in this early debate, so right. oh, can you just tell important. us... What was he? What was he responding to, and what were his arguments in that open letter? Yeah, I do discuss this on the on, uh, online l.org essay, so people can look for more information there. But it basically, Roy gave what would become the standard argument against uh, Randian minarchism. I know some limited government people don't like that term, but it's just become part of the lexicon in the libertarian movement. And the basic argument, he had a number of subsidiary arguments as well, but the basic argument was that according to Rand, and she was very specific about this, no government has the right to initiate the use of force. 
And Roy pointed out, well, if that's true, then how can a government claim a monopoly on protection, on justice services, so-called protection agencies? Uh, because in order to keep out competitors, it has to threaten them with force. It has to say, if you go in, even if your system is perfectly just, even if we have no complaints with how you conduct yourselves, we have the monopoly on this, so we're not going to allow you to compete. Therefore, how do you keep out competitors? Well, like in any industry, you keep out competitors by threatening coercion against them. This was the uh, basic, as he saw it, contradiction in Rand's defense of government. So you're that saying it was either no that to, you could either – they could either use force or agree to competition. Yeah, and he'd give the example because always – I mean, first of all, he pointed out the presumption that government is going to – any monopoly is going to become inefficient. So even if you have a government that's essentially just – if it's grown fat and lazy and people are unhappy with it, they have to pay too much in tax or in money, uh, Rand opposed taxation in theory. So coercive taxation really wasn't an issue. But suppose you have dissatisfied customers and they say, look, we have this other agency over here that's more efficient, less expensive. Let, we would rather go to them to resolve our disputes. So on what grounds can the government say? Maybe it uses even the same procedures as the government. Maybe there's no difference in substance between those two agencies. Nevertheless, a monopolistic government will say, no, no, we reserve that uh, that right of, of uh, deciding disputes, uh, legal uh, jurisdiction, to ourselves, and we won't let you go to somebody else. So now, according to Rand, again, this is the theory. She she did write some things saying, you know, I'm against taxation in principle, but – and then the yada, yada, yada followed, which always follows on those exceptions. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, the, the problem was what if somebody just refuses to pay for the government? Uh, now, according to Rand, you couldn't force them to pay. So can they go elsewhere? Can they take their money to another service? And Roy's argument was a, a, an objectivist government would not permit that. It would have to initiate force. And insofar as it initiated or threatened to initiate force, it would violate Rand's basic maxim of no one, including government, has the right to initiate force. And that brought in the whole thing of competing agencies that Murth, R Murray Rothbard wrote about, uh, Randy Barnett, who, by the way, once told me he was also convinced by Roy's open letter. And he's been a very influential, very high-level intellectual influence on libertarianism uh a law professor as you guys know but we, yeah, we were on sitting, the show. yeah we, I, yeah i heard that as a matter of fact um he, uh, he and i sat around one time at a conference and talked about who's been actually who was actually converted by that by that open letter and i don't remember all the people on it that he knew about that i knew about it, but there's quite a few people who are still very active in the libertarian movement who were uh, who were converted, if I can use that term, to the to the anarchistic cause. Later, I, I'm sure you want to get into this later, but Roy, Roy, as you know, later retreated from that and went back and embraced limited government, and that's a whole other story. Now, did Rand have a response to this letter? Did she reply to it, or if she didn't, did she have a argument directly against anarchism? Well, that's the odd thing. Uh, Roy later wrote uh, it was in that. Uh, papers just uh, – I heard also from Roy. Well, his well, – I don't need to tell you how I got the information. But basically what happened was Roy had a typescript of the manuscript and he saw a speech by Rand and he managed to hold, hand her a topi, copy of the manuscript. Uh, she didn't say anything. She Before it was published, it. you mean? Before it was published. Uh, he, the only response he got, he was cut off the objectivist mailing list and a subscription to the objectivist. So, wait, so wait, wait, they, they canceled your subscription? I mean, it wasn't the like cancel my subscription. It was they, they told you your subscription is now canceled. They did, you just got a note in the mail <laughs> saying uh, they, they didn't tell you. You don't deserve like, our newsletter anymore. It's sort, of, sort of like the Spanish Inquisition. You weren't <laughs> given many details. You just knew you were in trouble. <laughs> now, after that, there were various – Rand never replied directly to it. She had written some things. The thing that provoked – and I think Roy dealt with this in the open letter – I think it was in her article, The Nature of Government, and she wrote some – I hate to say this because I like Rand, but some pretty lame stuff about anarchism. I mean painting worst-case scenarios and failing to explain how government got out of those problems, you know. Uh, but – and that enraged a lot of us. Uh, well, it didn't – I mean she wrote them before Roy wrote his open letter, but that sort of opened the door. No, she never responded directly. Um, but some of her subordinates did in various venues. I think uh, Peter uh, Schwartz was one guy. And uh, Roy uh, had some unkind things to say about Peter Schwartz. <laughs> now you said you, – you yourself uh, – you write about this in the introduction, but it's like a, you set down 
your initial thought about the letter was that it was a little bit presumptuous. First of all, oh, yeah. it was like, Miss Rand, you should be an anarchist. Let me tell you why. Yeah. Um, yeah. From like a 19 year old kid. Was yeah. he, was he, Roy was 19 or so when he wrote it? He was 20. 20. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, I mean, it's basically, I'm going to show you the light sort of. Yeah. Uh, which article. is, I mean, which is hilarious. That's the attitude she had toward people. And if someone take that attitude toward her, it probably made her upset. But, but the, uh, but you try, you said, I'm going to kind of write something about this. And, and how did that go? I'm going to refute this. Well, I was in Tucson when I got – I'd heard about it in advance from some people. Oh, this article, you know, defending anarchism against Rand. Well, it's a big deal then. You have to understand. That kind of article today has it, become fairly common and there are so many outlets. Back then, there weren't many interlibertarian inter magazines. Uh, the individualists, earlier the rational individualists, was one of them. So this was a big deal. I mean, people were talking about it. And I was sort of the leader of my little subculture at the University of Arizona. I'd start a Students of Objectivism Club. So when my – I'd subscribed to the Rational Individualist. When it came – or maybe – I'm sorry. It could have been the Individualist by that time. I just – doesn't matter. But I don't remember the exact time of the name change. But uh, Jarrett Wolstein started the magazine. Uh, and uh, so I got it and I read it and it annoyed me. I've never read one of those articles. It just sort of aggravates you on a basic level. Mm -hmm. But you still know there's something there and you need to – calm down and not just put it aside and not think about it again, which I think is what a lot of objectivists did. I thought, yeah, but there's something here. So I thought, well, I, I'm as capable of writing a refutation this as anybody. So I was in my bedroom at my little portable electric typewriter, and I'd read through the article several times. I'd typed out some quotations, and I even had a title before I started writing. It was called uh, Strange Bedfellows. A reply to Roy A. Child's uh, Open Letter 9 Rand. Had you met Roy at this point? No, okay. no. Uh, we had corresponded because of the connection. I was running a SIL group on campus, so we knew of one another. Who were the and strange bedfellows? Beg your pardon? Who were the strange bedfellows? Well, Roy, time? considering himself sort of not an objectivist but sort of a neo-objectivist, he, he was trying to incorporate anarchism within the objectivist movement. And uh, – <clears throat> Anyway, I start out with the easier points. Some of his subsidiary points were not that difficult to answer, sort of. Uh, but I avoided the, that contradiction point that I explained earlier. I just thought, ah, there's got to be an answer to that. So I reread Rand's articles on government. I went through them several times. It was odd because I couldn't find any awareness of that problem at all, of how do you sustain the monopoly status of a government. And uh, so... I reread it, and I remember very distinctly. I had a little typewriter table with this typewriter, and I, I reread it over and over, and I sort of ran through it. And then suddenly I said, "I don't. There's just logically no way to answer that." And I remember thinking to myself, "Well, I guess I'm an anarchist." <laughs> and it wasn't like some did it, did great it hurt? religious. Did it feel? Did, it feel yeah, did that? Was that a difficult thought to have? No, and that's the odd thing. I think I mentioned this again in the introduction uh, to Roy's writings. It was very simple, and I speculate that. The reason it was, because I already accepted the basic premises. You know, it wasn't until later uh, that I realized that Rand, what Rand had really done is laid down some classic anarchist premises. Uh, one of the most important being is the illegitimacy, of course, of taxation. Now, once you start that ball rolling, you talk about a slippery slope. You know, this was not something new. I mean, you may be familiar with a very good, consistent libertarian in the 19th century named Oberon Herbert. He, oh, he yeah. One of, my, one of our favorites. Yeah. yeah. Well, Herbert was uh, in favor of what he called voluntary taxation. That's a phrase that Rand herself never used. But uh, Spencer disagreed with him on this. Oh, it's totally impractical. You're never, never going to sell that program. But, uh, her, but the American anarchists, the Benjamin Tucker School of Individualist Anarchists, uh, liked Herbert because of his voluntary taxation thing. But Herbert repudiated the term anarchist, claiming that this was a form of financing government. And basically the Tuckerite argument was, yeah, but I mean, maybe technically, but you're not going to be able to sustain a government if you have to actually let people decide whether they want to pay for your services or not. And they brought up the same problem. What if competing services want to, you know, get in the game? And that, by the way, that was an early argument. Uh, there was a fellow, a Tuckerite, um, wrote a book called Voluntary Socialism, Francis Tandy. Uh, Marilyn and I included an excerpt from that book, a, a privately printed book, which is not well known. It was met mentioned, however, by Nozick at one point. Uh, and, and Tandy comes straight out on a peculiar title, Voluntary Socialism to the Modern Year, but he was an individualist anarchist, free market type. And he explicitly laid out a plan to uh, 
take what are now legitimate government services and put them in the private market in the form of insurance companies as a model. And went into quite a bit of detail. It's a very interesting discussion. But anyway, I, when I realized that there was no way around this monopoly thing, I just uh, it was an easy transition. I, frankly, I didn't think it was that big of a deal. And I didn't think I, I learned differently when I went back to my little club, the, the sort of 10 people that were the core of it, and started saying, you know, we really should be anarchists. And let's just say that was not received with universal acclaim among some of the harder core Randians there. Oh, Miss Rand, Miss Rand has denounced anarchism. And I said, yeah, well, she was wrong. But that wasn't a good argument, I guess. When you had this conversion, was it was it a purely logical one in the yeah. sense of just like – OK, I'm, I know I'm opposed to the use of force and any state seems to require it because of this monopoly issue. So therefore, I'm an anarchist. But was there any like concern about, well, but maybe anarchism wouldn't work? Well, you know, that's an interesting point because I think one of the great values – people say to me all the time or in past years have said, well, what's the point of this? It's anarchism is never going to happen in America, which I have to agree with, by the way. So what's the point of debating it? Now, I think there are a number of issue, answers to that, but I think the most important for a libertarian audience is that it got us thinking about alternatives. I had never really considered before. I knew that Rothbard had advocated this sort of thing, but I'd never really considered before the implications of that in terms of how, in fact, would you structure uh, a competitive system? Randy Barnett uh, in The Structure of Liberty, he calls it legal pluralism, sort of a euphemism for anarchism. Uh, uh, he goes into quite a bit of detail about that in some articles he wrote for the Harvard Law Review and stuff he did also. But it got it got me and a lot of other people thinking. It sort of, you know, we awoke from our dogmatic slumbers mm -hmm. and thought, well, that's interesting. In particular, it got me thinking about justice and what is the ultimate criterion of justice uh, and could that be maintained in a competitive system? Uh, I actually put a lot of that in writing in some early articles I wrote for uh, the Journal of Libertarian Studies. The main one was called Justice, Entrepreneurship, and a Free Market. And the point of that article, which was really an offshoot of my thinking about my conversion to anarchism, was what market forces would tend to uh, work in favor of maintaining justice. And I developed an argument, kind of market incentives that would want justice agencies, as I call them, uh, to remain pure, so to speak, that uh, the sulling of the reputation, once they became known as an outlaw agency, they'd lose customers, more or less a standard libertarian argument. But I used uh, Israel Kirzner's concept of entrepreneurship and applied it to the issue of market forces that would favor justice, while conceding, of course, that you're always going to have bad eggs in any of these things. I didn't deny you're going to have outlaw agencies, you know, masquerading as justice agencies and that sort of thing. But that was well received. Uh, for the most part, in the libertarian community, and I still see it referenced from time to time. But you get this—I mean, the idea that you're, we're, we're, we have no sacred dogs in the state—it gets us thinking about other possibilities outside of monopoly, and that, and that's something you write about in the introduction too, which, which I think is really, really interesting. When you say there's a distinction between anarchy and anarchism, right? Yeah, can you talk a little bit about what that is? Yeah, I came up with those distinctions more or less on my own, just trying to clarify. I'm, I'm many things I've written in past years. Um, uh, it, I've actually written little mini essays just to myself, uh, trying to be clear about distinctions. And the point I was making there was that we often, first of all, that if you look up even in standard dictionaries, anarchy, uh, you'll find uh, one reference to a society without a state and another uh, definition being political chaos and confusion. So right away, we're off to a bad start here. But what I pointed out was that just as an advocate of minarchism doesn't endorse every form of government, so an advocate of anarchism needn't and won't endorse every type of anarchy. There can be chaotic anarchistic systems. There can be vicious anar uh, anarchies. So to call yourself an anarchist and somebody says, oh, they've got anarchy over there in that country and look at all the slaughter going on. Well, what's the implication there? Uh, supposedly, just because you don't have a government. A, a lack of a government, in other words, is necessary but not sufficient for a good society in anarchist theory. Anarchism is a theory, a positive theory. Anarchy is simply the absence of government. And you can have all kinds of stuff, good and bad, without, without government. Uh, well, there's an interesting analogy you make in there, with, like you, you kind of just said it too, that, that 
an anarchist does not endorse every stateless society as being good um, and just like a, a statist, a, a believer in government doesn't endorse every form of government as being good and, and just such right, a system. Right, exactly. So you and want a system of, of working, peaceful, effective institutions in the in, – in the, that's what you're advocating for, not just Somalia, for example. Right. But that's very common as you may know that uh, when someone – a libertarian finds out you're an anarchist, they'll go, well, they've got anarchy over in Somalia or wherever or in the Middle East somewhere. So you, you, you approve of that and – I, I'll say, well, by the way, if you hear a tweeting, I have my parakeet I got recently. <laughs> I covered him up with a sheet so he'd be quiet, but I think he's cheering what I'm saying. I'd like to I take it. It's, that's a, not it's a good backdrop. It's fine. <laughs> All right. Uh, anyway, uh, but it's like me saying uh, to, some, uh, to some objectivist advocate of limited government, I says, well, you're, you believe in government. Well, look at the government in Iran. So you approve of you approve of, you're, you're pro government. So does that mean you approve of the government of Iran? Well, of course, say no, no, no. I believe in this type of government. Well, in same way, uh, individualist anarchists will say I believe in this type of anarchy, an anarchy, a, a, a society, a stateless society in which there are in fact mechanisms to enforce justice, that sort of thing. Now to go and, back. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to go back to Roy because Roy used autarky. Yeah, and it's in his earlier writings. That was under the influence of Robert Lefebvre. Who uh, was uh, – who started the Rampart School, correct? Yeah, he started in Colorado. He and his associates actually built from scratch these wonderful cabins. I never saw them. I said it was wonderful. Uh, they had a library, a dining hall, uh, rooms for students and – I think they were financed originally by – what's his name? Milliken. He was a textile uh, uh, businessman that uh, Lefebvre met. But anyway, everyone spoke very highly of the courses that were given there. Roy, I think he was a sophomore in Buffalo uh, at college. He went to that. He got a scholarship. And they were so impressed with him that they invited him to become a lecturer. So he quit college and uh, but before he could actually – start his lecturing or teaching career, there was a terrible flood. I guess his place was in kind of a valley in Mark, near Larksburg, Colorado. And it basically, they couldn't dig themselves out of the financial hole. So Rampart, which later became, I think, called the Freedom School, uh, basically moved to Orange County. They just had an, a suite of offices there. They didn't have nearly, they did some programs, but they didn't have nearly the uh, facilities of, you know, they weren't able to do nearly the, this, as much as they had done previously. But Roy was very much influenced by um, um, Lefebvre, and he wrote some very important articles, interesting articles, before he wrote his open letter to Rand. Now, remember, he was like 17, 18 when he wrote these things. And like Lefebvre, who expressly repudiated the term anarchy or anarchism, because uh, he thought it had bad associations, essentially, uh, Roy talked about autarky, not anarchy. And I don't think it was until he wrote his open letter that he started using the term anarchism. But nowhere that I know of, in fact, Roy didn't even discuss it with me. I was largely unaware of his, uh, I knew about his association with Lefebvre. But even to the point where in his early articles, Roy slammed political action by libertarians. And he later became a big advocate of the Libertarian Party. But he used uh, some of the same arguments that the voluntarists, the anti-political libertarians, including myself, later used. Um, that basically you were playing you were playing into the government's hands by you legitimated through voting, but he was well aware of that, and he so his views changed in a number of ways, including the terminological shift from the term autarky to anarchy. And would you say Roy himself was sort of a combination of Lefebvre, Rothbard, and Rand? Were those his biggest influences? Do you think? Well, that's a good point. I think he was a combination of Rothbard and Rand. Both were very influential. But I don't – as far as I can tell, his Lefebvian uh, beliefs pretty much disappeared. I never saw any trace of Lefebvre's writings. I did a public debate at Los Angeles Libertarian Supper Club. This is probably, I guess, in the late eight, uh, 70s with Bob Lefebvre. He's a very nice guy, old, old school gentleman, very gracious man. I liked him a lot. And we debated the issue of retaliatory force. Because uh, Lefebvre was a pacifist, and he didn't believe in the use of violence, even basically in self-defense. And so as I was preparing for the debate, I talked to Roy, who knew Lefebvre very well, and he coached me. He said, now, he's weak on this issue. Bring up this example. The example he wanted me to bring up was if somebody shoots a gun at me, am I uh, 
you know, do I have to wait till the bullet hits my body before I can, <laughs> and then claim ownership of the bullet? <laughs> so, and but then, actually, and then I did, throw it back at them. <laughs> yeah, because uh, Lefebvre did have this theory as to if somebody stabbed you with a knife, why you would pull the knife out if it belonged to the other guy? He says, well, once it goes in your body, it, it basically belongs to you. It's kind of You can imagine innovative. a criminal gang that uses this to... Yeah, exactly. We're it's just going to swallow the stolen jewels. <laughs> well, I, I did use some of these arguments with Bob, and he got visibly annoyed with me, which kind of bothered me. I thought, well, maybe... Because, frankly, some of his positions on that were just indefensible. Uh, I mean, theoretically. But he did have a respect. Uh, he, he wrote a very nice booklet called The Philosophy of Ownership, I believe. And he had a really good uh, beat on history. I just thought his theoretical defense of pacifism uh, was just not defensible, really, even to the point of denying the individual right of self-defense. He used to talk about a couple muggers coming up to him on the street and trying to take his wallet, and he talked him out of it. Now, maybe Bob could do that. He was a very uh, charismatic fellow, but, you know, it's not something that I think works very often. <laughs> so so Lefebvre, Lefebvre sent Roy to in some directions, but it was really Rothbard and Rand. As far and, as I can see, Rothbard completely flipped him around. I never saw any trace of Lefebvre influence in Roy, so, except the stress on education. But that was a stress that all of the major libertarian figures We made. still do that today. That's what libertarianism.org is about. So right. it's, it's always the case. What what did a you mentioned some of the Roy's jobs? What, what what were his jobs? Some of them when you were living in the in, with him in the same apartment building. Well, he had a bunch of different ones, but the his main activities, as I may have mentioned, when we were in that apartment on Selma apartment building, uh, were uh, he was the editor of uh, Books for Libertarians, which at that time was a kind of one of those fold over long sheets folded over, and I think there were usually eight pages. He wrote reviews every month for that. And he got paid for those. He had me write quite a few reviews also. And I was thankful because I got $25 a review. And uh, considering I was living on zero income, basically, while writing most of that book, that meant something. That, by the way, was also the standing fee for writing book reviews for uh, Barbara Brandon's and Bob Barrow's book news. It was $25 a pop. And uh, <clears throat> so I made a little money, extra money that way. And he, he was also working on his uh, Anarchism and Justice series. Uh, he was towards the end of that series by the time I met him. But then he moved on later. Uh, Bob Kephart had him come out to the East Coast. This kind of fell through. He wanted to expand Libertarian Review. Roy later um, uh, became editor of Libertarian Review. I think that was from 77 to 81. Uh, then he was a policy analyst from Cato. I, I made a note before we started this. I'm sort of reading it. From 82 to 84. <clears throat> he then became... Uh, the editor and chief reviewer for Laissez Faire Books, uh, which was and that a, was starting in '84, and that continued until his death in 1992. And he used to write an astounding number of reviews. Yes, it's really a remarkable. And he was a very good reviewer. And I know from being around him so much. I mean, when you live in the same building and you're walking down to his place and knocking on the door, and he's typing away and working on a certain review, he'd read some reviews to me. I thought his reviews were remarkable on a number of levels, uh, some of which I explain in the uh, artic uh, the articles people can read on L.org. Um, but he was always honest, uh, with one exception. I had a big argument with him about it. It caused sort of a personal rift. The Irving, the Irving Crystal discussion? Yeah. yeah I, I didn't think I, that kind of, you know. Uh, you, you never you never resolve that. So the issue, yeah, well, explain the issue because not all of our listeners have, have also read the Well, essay. the problem in my view, and I used to tell him this straight out, and he'd get kind of pissed. Uh, we'd have arguments, but we're the type that could argue pretty heatedly, and then after it was over, I was like with Jeff Rickenbach like this too. It was another close friend of Roy's, uh, very active in the early movement in, in the L.A. area. Uh, we would be in shouting matches, and then we'd just, okay, that's over, and let's have a beer. Uh, we didn't, you know, it was remarkable that to be able to argue with people like that and let it all out and not hold a grudge. But there was a grudge held by Roy on this issue. Uh, Roy got political, as I used to tell him. I said, Roy, you've gotten political, and it's affecting your intellectual candor. Uh, that happened when the LP was formed, and Roy got very interested in it. And I, I, if I were to mark kind of a bad turning point in Roy's life, I would say it was at his intense interest in political activity, because that took all of his time away from substantive theoretical issues, for the most part, not entirely. And his er that's why his earliest, best earliest theoretical writings are early in his career. 
And I said, Roy, I just think you're wasting your talent. There are plenty of people out there, if you believe in the Libertarian Party, that can do that kind of work. Your, your real talent is in theory and history, and that's what you should do. What did it mean for him to turn political? What kind of stuff was he doing? Well, he LP? was very active with Rothbard initially, although they had a falling out and a personal break over issues involving the Libertarian Party. Uh, he was very active. He talked a lot about running to run. run. I'm sorry to laugh when I say this, but... If you knew Roy, uh, he wanted to run for state senator of California, <laughs> uh, for senator of California, and he was even practicing his. Um, now, I don't take this Stump the wrong speech. way. I, 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 well, see this. I hesitate to tell these sort of eccentric stories about Roy because people get the wrong impression. He was a very brilliant guy. He was well connected to the world, but he, when he did something, he went all out. And I walked into his uh, apartment one time, and even that early, he was watching a, a, a show like. And on TV, on PBS or something, uh, they had Hitler's speeches. Now, he didn't speak a word of German. I said, why are you watching that? He says, well, I want to get an idea. I mean, he was a son of a bitch and an evil guy, but he was an effective propagandizer to the masses. So when I speak to the masses, I and he was watching his arm movements and all that stuff Hitler did. And I actually saw him give a speech not long after that, and he went a little overboard with the arm <laughs> movements, you know. <laughs> and I said, he said, what did you think? I said, well, the speech was good, right? But I really think you should cut down on the, <laughs> on, the, on the gestures. You know, this isn't, you know, a mass audience of tens of thousands. This is a supper club with, you know, 45 people. But he did get the audience at the LP. It was in 70, oh, yeah. 79 when he got them to come to the Oh, LP. yeah, that was a classic Do we have speech. that video on the side here? His I think you do. I may be on just an audio recording. Or, I don't think it was. A, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great – they went. They were standing up and cheering. Oh, they were stopping cheering. on the floor. I wasn't there, but I heard secondary accounts. Oh, he was a great speaker. So maybe, and, and I'm making fun of him here, kind of in a, a, in a loving a way. way. It's, it's a yes. Yeah, but I may, it must have done him some good. Uh, but I always thought he was an excellent speaker, and he used to. I used to sit down in his Cato lectures. He gave the Cato lectures, uh, the first two called the Ethics of Liberty. Um, later, for various reasons, he didn't lecture for Cato anymore. I took over those two lectures for a while, and uh, but he was very good. He was very engaging. The problem was later in life, he was so heavy, he had trouble standing for any length of time. And it was kind of a running joke that he'd have an assistant at, at his lectures and literally she'd put like 10 glasses of water on the table and he would drink all of them during the course of his talk. But he was very quick on his feet. One of the best speakers I've ever heard, frankly. And uh, So you were talking about getting political and, and the Yeah, he just got so him, wrapped up in Crystal. politics that he just didn't have the time or interest. And so what happened with Crystal is that um, this was before I, I this is while I was still living in the same apartment building he had was going to review Crystal's book I think it's called Two Cheers for Capitalism it's a collection of his essay, early essays Irving Crystal being the so called godfather of neoconservatism um, and he uh, he did talk to me independently he had won a, a, a contest for the best essay which got him a free trip to the Mount Pelerin Society meeting I don't know where it was held that year, maybe Belgium or someplace. So he was supposed to give a speech, and Crystal was going to be at that meeting. Anyway, he had developed this grand strategy to convert Irving Crystal to libertarianism. <laughs> and he to told libertarianism me, or to anarchism? No, to libertarianism generally. Okay. Uh, bit of a stretch to make a neocon an anarchist. But, uh, so I was aware of this, and he said he was going to review Crystal's book in libertarian uh, in, uh the, the book review periodical when it was still called Libertarian Review, but before it turned into a magazine. Meanwhile, I go back to Tucson. I'd finished my book. I was, needed to rest up, so I stayed with my parents for a while. So I get a copy of the review, and uh, I just thought it was – for the first time, I thought Roy had written a review that wasn't completely intellectually honest because he praises the book. It's just full of scintillating insights and um, – Get got him thinking about a lot of issues. And then he mentions the chapter on censorship, and he calls it – I forget how he put it. He didn't call it weak, but he said it It had some problems or something – some watered-down criticism. Well, I, I ordered the book immediately from Leslie Fuhr Books uh, thinking, well, wow, Jeans must be pretty good. And I was just appalled by the book. I didn't think any of the essays were particularly good. They certainly didn't get me thinking new thoughts. I thought it was just pretty much hackneyed stuff. But when I got to the chapter on censorship, and Crystal says this outright, said, lest there be a mistake, I'm calling for government censorship of not only uh, literature, but also uh, movies, you know, across the board. Yeah, everything to make people more virtuous and better. Yeah, yeah. That, that's part of the, the neocon plan. You have to have virtue before you can have freedom. So 
coincidentally, I was getting married, and I asked Roy if he'd be my best man. He said yes, so I sent him plane tickets to fly out from Hollywood to Tucson. And after the marriage, uh, the, after the reception, a small group of people, um, in fact, Michael Emmerling, that's what we call him at the time. He's now known as Michael Cloud. He was active in a lot of libertarian stuff, uh, party stuff. But he was there, and there were maybe six people sitting in my living room, and we got into a discussion of Crystal and his review. And at first, I was kind of polite. I said, Roy, I don't know why you wrote that review. I said, it's real, that book is junk, and he, he doesn't, he's not just weak on the censorship, Roy. He's an outright advocate of censorship. You know, it's not that he's got some mistakes or flaws that are minor, you know. Um, he wants to censor everything, basically. Well, Roy challenged me on, on that. He said, I never said that. And now, I had a copy of LR, Libertarian Review. I had a separate office that I did my work. It was on Tanker Birdie Road in Tucson. And it was about a 15-minute drive each way. I got so angry that I drove to my office to get a copy of, of my review, and which quoted him directly, and drive back. And then I read it to him. This was, this was during your wedding reception? Well, it's my wedding – I know. I, I'm a typical libertarian. My wife was I have was to there. solve this problem before. Hold on, well, honey. This, was, yeah, yeah. What a, did your wife think of this? Well, she was kind of into it herself. But, uh, so I brought it back and read it and it said what I claimed it said. And Roy kind of puffed himself up and said I was questioning his integrity. And uh, I – that was difficult for me. I, I, I did go I, – I basically said that he had uh, – kiss Crystal's ass in the hope of converting him. He wanted to cozy up to him uh, because if you read the essay he wrote for the Mount Pelerin Society, he also mentioned the distinguished audience, including Irving Crystal, and that Crystal had posed one of the most profound problems of the 20th century. How do we maintain a culture of freedom? And um, well, yeah, as opposed to being like you're not a believer in freedom, you should you should get out of here. That, that would that would have been a little weird, but that's, maybe that's what he should have said. <laughs> like, anyway, oh. Roy took it as a personal insult, and, and admittedly, I was heated up because I didn't appreciate making a half hour drive just to prove my point For, to prove yourself right. But then you you liked it at the end of the day. So, well, because you, you were correct. You, uh, it did cor it did bother me. We didn't really talk after that. Uh, I didn't. Roy and I didn't really talk after that for about two or three years. Uh, he was involved with other things. We weren't in the same city anyway, but we didn't talk on the phone. We later patched things up, and during the last three years of his life, it was slight exaggeration. I'd say we talked on the phone nearly every day uh, for at least an hour. Uh, it, was a, it was a normal part of my life then. And uh, in some ways, it wasn't until those later years of our phone conversations that I got to know certain parts of his personality that I never really got to know before. And he, he knew when he called me. He usually called me, and uh, yeah. Sometimes he'd be drunk, sometimes not, but usually drunk. <laughs> uh, Roy was had a problem with alcohol. and But I never condemned him. I never judged him. He knew that I would listen to him and tell him what I honestly thought. And uh, we became very, very close. I also saw him, uh, the last times I saw him when he was lecturing at the Cato Conference in uh, Dart at Dartmouth, um, uh, I remember we'd spend a lot of time together. I'd watch him with students. And uh, he, he was in such bad health then that the distance from the uh, dorm rooms where we stayed with the students to the cafeteria couldn't have been more than a five minute walk, maybe seven minutes. I, I usually walked with Roy over there and he often, he always had to sit down and take a rest two, maybe three times in what would be a five minute walk. At that point he was over 400 pounds and could barely walk at all. So it was, it was sad, very sad. I'm curious about the, the book reviews because it is, I mean, he wrote a lot of them. He's well known for the book reviews that he wrote for laissez-faire books. And right. I should note um, a couple of years ago, Trevor and I got tasked with that the Roy's library was given to the Cato Institute and right. we were tasked with going through those boxes of books and organizing them and putting them in the new library on the second floor here at Cato. It's an interesting way of kind of getting to know someone. Yeah, it is it's yes, it's yeah, be very it's, personal. Yes, it's extremely personal to go through someone's library, and it's, it was an astonishing collection of books. Um, yeah. And he had very good taste. All right. Um, but so you you lamented that when he turned towards politics, he stopped doing the the theoretical writings that you wish he had done. But did any of that theoretical work emerge in that body of book reviews? Was he kind of doing oh, yeah. theoretical thinking behind the scenes by way of reviewing books? In fact, I'd say there's a good deal of theoretical work and that's where I should make a, an exception to my general statement. He did include a lot of very interesting theoretical comments. But if you look at his major essays, both his history and theory, 
uh, most of them are written in the late 70s, uh, late 60s, early 70s. He did write, I think around 75, an extensive critique of Robert Nozick's uh, Anarchy, State, and Utopia. That was published in the Journal of Libertarian Studies. And he was writing what was supposed to be uh, an extensive critique of anarchism and explaining his own conversion to minarchism. But um, after he died, uh, that was never published for various reasons. I don't think, but he never completed it. Joan Kennedy Taylor went through his papers, I think are now at Stanford, unpublished papers, and did find a fragment, which you guys reprinted in that collection of Roy's articles. Uh, I think it was called, um, uh, gosh, I can't remember the title he gave to it. But that was where he explained that he had changed his mind about anarchism and had converted to limited government, and he was going to explain why. That seems like the big mystery, especially for a guy who converted so many people to anarchism. Yeah, uh, that was uh, – I discussed it extensively with him or asked him extensively about it during those last three years. He seemed to have given different explanations to different people, which is not all that unusual. But the explanation that I got from him, I said, Roy, you know, that would be a very significant article. And you can't you figure out some way to write it and get it published? He said, well – Bill Bradford at Liberty Magazine, at that point it was a print magazine, I think it's, if it exists anymore, I think it's all online, I'm not even sure it exists anymore, uh, wants, me to, wants to publish it, but I told him I wanted $500, and he, he said his, quote, policy was not to pay for articles, which is kind of ridiculous, because the policy was what, he was the owner and publisher, I mean, it was what he said it was. Now, I, I didn't know Bill, I, of course, I published some things in Liberty myself, but didn't know him, but I thought that's really too bad that he didn't fork up the 500. He could afford it. And uh, that article, had it been published, would have been very, very significant. But he never did write the thing. And, uh, you know, if I'd had the 500 at the time that I could spare, I would have paid him the 500 because it would have been important. But the impression I got, and I think I explained this in one of those uh, L.org posts, I kept asking him, okay, Roy, just give me the essentials of the argument. I don't need a complaint, but I'm curious curious how you get around your own argument about the monopoly problem. And I badgered him quite a bit. Come on, Roy, tell me. You know, come on, you, you know, da, da, da. And as I explained in one of those articles, uh, finally, and it wasn't long before he died, um, uh, he opened up a little bit. He, he said, I said, so what's the basic point you're, you're making? And he said to me, and this is an exact quote, he says, well, anarchism isn't practical. Now, knowing Roy, there was a lot more thought behind that. And I should have realized that and said, okay, what? I don't understand. What do you mean? And tried to draw him out more. But I was in a belligerent mood. I'd gotten annoyed because I had had so much time to get him. And I was used to the old Roy who would argue with you until you were, you know, drove you into the ground. And I said, that's it, Roy? That's your great secret refutation? <laughs> I call it a secret refutation because it was secret if you didn't tell anybody. That's your secret refutation of anarchism? It isn't practical? Then there was this long pause. And he said, you're mocking me. And I said, okay, Roy, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry, but anyway, go ahead. And he said, no, I don't want to talk about this anymore. So that's all he ever told me. I, I made the big mistake of shutting him down. Because I think he he knew that the, that the people he had converted, like myself or Randy and others, uh, would be were very interested in the argument, but they'd also hold him to pretty high standards. Because he was tough on minarchists. I mean, he didn't hesitate to drive minarchists into the ground with arguments when you know he was on the anarchist side. So, you know, I figured he'd expect that himself. And I, my honest opinion is that he wasn't really happy with his own ideas about it. I don't think he really came across any earth-shattering news beyond the usual thing, which even I admit anarchism isn't practical in terms of current politics. But I think that was probably another influence on him on his interest in politics. Meaning by that, if libertarians are going to get anywhere in the political world, they've got to drop all the talking about anarchism because people are just immediately – going to turn off. That's generally true, yes. And it is true. I agree that it's true, which is why I've always said that anarchists shouldn't get involved in political movements. Uh, first of all, you're not going to be taken seriously. And I understand that. You know, It doesn't mean you give up the ideal. It doesn't mean that the ideal is flawed. But to be practical, you know, if uh, some politicians out there running on, I'm an anarchist, vote for me. Well, aside from the kind of strange self -con contradiction, <laughs> yeah, there's a contradiction yeah. there. <laughs> I'm against political power, so give me political power so I can abolish political power. Uh, there's some problems there. But aside from that, uh, we all knew that anarchism, it was something, it was sort of one of those in-house debates, you know, where we talk among ourselves. And I think theoretically it's very significant because it focuses on certain issues about the nature of sovereignty. And it also focuses the problem of certain practical 
effects of government. Its monopoly status does account for a lot of, broadly speaking, for a lot of the inefficiencies in such in government. But to actually go out, and I think and advocate anarchism in a political movement is just suicide. You just stab yourself with a knife before you go to the podium and just be done with it because that's what you know, you're committing political suicide. But then at least you'll own that knife. <laughs> yeah, maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe you'll own that knife. So I, so, I, I know the answer to this question, but uh, but I assume you miss Miss Roy a lot. Me? Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I know, I do. I used to talk to Barbara Brandon a lot since I moved to Bloomington 15 years ago. We spoke on the phone a lot, and. Uh, she said that she sometimes thought about Roy almost every day. And I, if not every day, even after all these years, I often think about him. He's just one of those guys or people that just leaves an indelible impression on you. And as I said, life was never boring when you're with around Roy. And uh, if he was a remarkable talker, he was also a very good listener. I, I rarely run across someone who listened as efficiently or intensely as Roy did. If you had a personal problem, if you were a friend of his... He would listen very seriously and give you his best advice. And sometimes the advice was good, sometimes not so good. But I took his advice so seriously, uh, in the story I've related before, um, we, and we spoke very frankly. Um, he would give me kind of guru advice about my career. And at one point he said to me, I don't remember the occasion, but it was while we were in his apartment on Selma. He said, George, you're great in theory, but you're tabula rasa in history. In other words, you don't know anything about history, and you need to learn history. Um, I took it so seriously that I, within days I had resolved that once I finished my book, I wasn't going to read anything except history for five years. That turned into ten years, uh, at least a decade, maybe more. So that gives you an indication. When Roy gave me serious advice like that, not just joking around, but serious advice, I took him very seriously because he was very well-rounded, much more rounded than I was. He had a good grasp of history, uh, certain areas of it. And if you read that, uh, I know that L.org has posted this, uh, Big Business and the Rise of American Statism. Uh, that was published in early 70s, I think 71, by Reason Magazine in several parts. It was first given as a lecture in 1969, as I recall. That shows you, even at the time, that very young age, when he was uh, writing uh, Open Letter to Ayn Rand, his view of history was very sophisticated. I recently read the first part of that, where Roy gives a philosophy of history. Frankly, it holds up remarkably well even today. There's nothing in it I disagree with, but he actually goes into a sort of a prologue about the meaning that history can have. He criticizes a Marxian view of history, tells, explains why from a libertarian point of view it's so important. Uh, it's a wonderful little piece on the philosophy of history, and a very early piece. And he, he was probably, what, around 19, 20 when he wrote that? It's really quite remarkable. Yeah, definitely definitely a, a remarkable guy. Uh, do you have any – in terms of the most important essays that some you think people should l read by him, which ones? Would yeah, you well, use? I think his best overall theoretical piece was Anarchism and Justice, which I think – one part of that was never published. There's some controversy about whether he ever wrote it. I don't think he did, uh, but I think it was published in four parts. It's more like a monograph, and I think theoretically it's of more significance than his open letter to Ayn Rand. It's written in a calmer, more measured tone, and basically what he did was went through the traditional arguments for government. I think he may have voted one to Rand, but I'm not sure, But uh, and discussed the traditional arguments for the necessity of government. And I do remember one of his later parts. I remember this because he was working on it when we were living in the same building. Uh, he was discussing Mortimer J. Adler, the Aristotelian philosopher, in a book called The Common Sense of Politics. He reviewed it for Libertarian Review. And uh, <clears throat> he told me that he thought uh, Adler's case for government was the best he had seen and that it, at points he almost converted him. Uh, but ultimately he didn't. But uh, uh, I read the book a long time ago, and I thought it was a good book. So um, I would, But I would recommend The Anarchism and Justice. The open letter to Ayn Rand is almost necessary reading just because of its historical importance. The other thing that's very good, and it's probably the most sophisticated thing he wrote about the anarchist controversy, was the crit critique of, of Bob Nozick. Um, it's called The Invisible Hand Strikes Back. And it was published in Journal of Libertarian Studies. I don't recall the year. I think it was 1975. It can be found online. And uh, that's a very interesting and at times humorous discussion of Nozick's uh, argument for a minimal state, as he called it. And beyond that, you know, it's just hard to think what I wouldn't recommend. I mean, uh, 
The big business in the rise of American statism is very important. However, I think that he took Gabriel Coco uh, too much at his word. I later did some research on Coco, and I thought he fudged quite a bit. Uh, I think it, Coco's... I don't, maybe your listeners... I'm sorry, may not even know who Coco is. Gabriel Coco <laughs> was a Marxist historian who went against traditional Marxist uh, history, claiming that the progressive era, going from, say, 1880 through the early 1900s, was not a time of increasing monopolies, that the attempts of these large uh, companies in oil and, you know, the Rockefeller Group and uh, all these people and other industries to form these pools fell apart. And, in fact, there was increasing competition during that period. And that's what so bothered the really big giants in, in industry and that they are the ones who initiated not only antitrust legislation but other government regulation as ways of keeping out the smaller competitors. Today we call that crony capitalism. And Coco gave very extensive statistics to show this. The number of companies that increased in railroads was another one. I mean, much of the railroad legislation was not only backed but proposed by the major railway companies as a means of establishing the status quo, keeping prices up. Because these competitors are so, coming in and charging far less. This was, a, this was a source for Roy's statism, but you think he took it at its, at its face? Well, no. Well, no, a Coco. Uh, well, the Coco was it, a source for Roy on his big business in the right. Yeah, that bo- that book uh, basically is a summary of Coco's work, and he talks about the significance of Gabriel Coco, uh, how he's a Marxist and he thinks he's proving a Marxist case, but he's really not. He's actually supporting a libertarian case for a free market. Um, but, but but it sounds like there's not much that you wouldn't recommend for Roy in general, though. Yeah, I guess I gave a list of almost all his writings. <laughs> it depends on what your interests are. Um, if I were to recommend only one thing by Roy, it would probably be the Anarchism and Justice articles. But yeah, there's there's merit in, in, in virtually everything Roy published. And he had a lot of unpublished material. I assume these are with his unpublished papers at Stanford. I kind of hope they are, but they were kind of off topic from a libertarian point of view. Um, one of the first un- – he Murray – Aside from his book reviews, I don't think Roy ever wrote a short article. He, uh, one of the first things he gave me when I met him in California was a 20-page, single-page manuscript called In Defense of Rational Bisexualism. Um, r- later, when Roy decided he was gay, not bisexual, he wrote a long criticism of Nathaniel Brandon's views on homosexuality, which at that time Brandon held fairly conventional views that, you know, in psychiatrists at the time. And I remember sitting in on at least one argument he had with Brandon about this. So whenever Roy had a strong belief about something, he'd sit down and write not a couple pages. He'd write 20, 30 page essays and going extensively into these arguments. And I just thought that was a fascinating aspect of his uh, personality. So it's pretty obvious that Roy had a profound impact on you. But what's his impact been on the libertarian movement itself, his continuing influence? Well, that's a difficult question to answer because more and more I've found that younger libertarians barely know the name. He's one of those guys who is very important at the time, influenced a lot of people, but his writings were fairly few, his published writings, never wrote a book. So his influence has been mainly through uh, what I would call second generation or third generation libertarians. In other words, without Roy, I don't think the anarchism minarchism debate would be nearly as live as it remains um, so he established a lot of themes, you might say, but those themes weren't so much are carried on, not so much because people directly read his writings, unless the collection that L.org did of his writings has become a bestseller, uh, which I probably not the case. Uh, people learn about Roy's ideas through the medium of the people that he influenced. Um, he was a teacher in the best sense. Uh, John Stuart Mill once said of Jeremy Bentham that he was a teacher of teachers. I think that applies to Roy. Uh, he he had a lot of influence. I mentioned Randy Barnett. There are other names who have then sort of carried on his tradition. So even though his name isn't super famous, he's not a name like Rothbard or Rand, uh, but he is. Uh, his ideas are very important in terms of being transmitted by people that he directly influenced. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.